more detail, both in the notes on U U University of Acadia and in the, in the, the notes on uh, the legal sites, which identify different um, standings of, of address. But what I think would probably be the best thing, because there's a lot of information and a lot of different techniques that people are using, is that this, I think, warrants its own section on University of Acadia. And when we get to this type of material on the, on the legal sites, that we make available different working examples that people have done to show how an address for the delivery of correspondence can be made without it being by default a residential address. So no, that was a bit of a long-winded answer, but I think the short, the short thing is let us get something up on the University of Acadia as examples and let us provide the material for you uh, in the coming week, week and a half, two weeks on the uh, legal sites to show different examples of how people have achieved that. Um, I'm just going to go to East Pennsylvania and then I'll keep going through your questions. Uh, East Pennsylvania, can you hear us? Stego, how are you doing? Uh, doing well. Yes. The gentleman uh, which was asking about uh, uh, if he could inherit the will, uh, inherit the Social Security, yep. if they cashed the check for $255, that's what it was when I, when I received it from my father, no, because that, that is a closeout check. Right. You could do that if you didn't, if you didn't, uh, if you didn't sign the final check. Which comes to the comes to the estate, and that's for burial. Okay, um, I'm hoping that uh, Pathfinder will come on tonight, and he'll, he'll tell you what he did up up north, and the way he uh, um, handled the courts up in Ottawa. Yeah. So, um, just wanted to get to that and then tell that gentleman that. Uh, yeah, give me a call this week, okay? Yeah, I will. I will. And thank you for everything you're doing. All right. All the brother. Okay. Bye. Uh, another follow-up question before we get to the next caller. And please, please, if you want to speak, I'd love to hear from you. So far, I've, I haven't made too many mistakes in unmuting and muting. So I'll get to the next uh, person uh, in a moment. But let's have a quick drink of water and then ask, answer a question about... Um, helping prison, people in prison. So the question is, uh, is there a way to help someone in prison get out for tax evasion? Um, look, for whatever reason someone is in prison, um, there, is, there is help that can be made. We, we have had a, a thing called great risks that we haven't pursued because we've been still working on these remedies. And there is, I believe, going to be uh, remedy for people in prison. Uh, one, one is uh, in terms of uh, making sure that their standing uh, can be repaired, in making sure that they have this background material. People are put in prison because ultimately um, the system railroads them. Um, they may and, and also got affect that. that in most cases, when people are in prison, there is something there that they can use as an argument to put them in prison. Um, I am particularly keen to help those that are in prison as political prisoners, um, that have been put in prison for unjust reasons as a priority. I, I think this is something that as societies that the local campuses, once they're running, we should definitely focus on helping. Um, there are different remedies that people pursue. One is the appeals process. Um, some have tried to get the habeas corpus when people are sitting in prison on remand. Um, so there are different ways. The, the short answer is yes. Have we got something to show you? No. We haven't been perfecting and finishing the, the great writs until we deal with these other areas. Um, I think it's probably beneficial that we didn't because we certainly know a lot, lot more about how the system runs and how the system um, gets away with what they're doing. 
So I, I hope that there will be a tangible answer to the question of those unfairly imprisoned in, and it's going to be more than just a couple of weeks. It'll be in four or five, six weeks where we start to see finally some detail on the Great Ritz appear on the sites. And then I hope we can actually have some others chipping in and talking about um, action to help people. Because there are a lot, a lot of people imprisoned unjustly for trumped up charges, for things that really they shouldn't be in prison for. And I, I think... Uh, there are far, far too many people put in prison uh, simply because they can make money on the bonds and that uh, the system uses that to keep people away or to defend um, or stop forms of corruption that, against them, action against them. So let's come back to that. I'm going to go to the next uh, phone line here and unmute guest 27. And I hope I can unmute it. Uh, and see that hello, it works. Hello, Frank. Hi. How are you going? Hello, Frank. Yeah, this hi. Robert, Roberto calling from Canada. Hi, Robert. Hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for another incredibly enlightening information call this evening, as always. And, um, Thanks. I have two questions, if I may. Um, yeah. The first one is, would you recommend rescinding all currently existing contracts, such as a driver's license, Social Security, and BC, or would you do the BC differently? Um, my my f feeling is uh, it's important to understand that they're using those to create the presumption that you're an employee, but the rebuttal of the presumption doesn't require you to expunge them. The rebuttal is simply when they send you a demand to say, thank you, please uh, provide me the pay slip uh, as a government employee, otherwise um, your presumption is rejected. So I, the law of necessity means we must survive. And as I'm sure you know, they won't allow us to even open up a bank account without some form of social security and tax number, yeah? Correct. So in a sense, they're not giving us the option to um, survive without um, effectively um, entering into contracts which imply that we are some form of slave or some form of employee. Well, that's not consent. That's the law of necessity. You see what I'm saying? Yes. I just, I, I just wonder if they would accept that as a valid um, argument. Um, well, well, it is a valid argument. I mean, it's, a, it's an argument that, that can't be denied. I mean, the law, the law of necessity is, can I have a bank account without, without admitting through your form to being an employee or to being uh, a slave? The answer is no. Okay, well then, by necessity, I have to do it. If there was a choice, if you said to me, I can have a bank account and I can earn money without a social security or tax number, then great, show that to me and I will gladly um, cancel those. Yeah? Show me yeah. how to, to drive a, a motor vehicle as an executor of an estate where I will provide the underwriting if I have an accident. I will pay the damages. If I am at fault, I will pay the damages. But I will drive as an executor, not as an employee, and your people do not have the right to come and invade my property and, and reap money off me as some cash cow, show me how I can do that and still be acknowledged as being a lawful, lawful uh, um, official business, and I will drop my driver's license and I will drop everything else. But the reality is that they don't let you. And if they don't let you, then the laws and necessities say, we do what we do to survive. Yeah? Yes. Now, would the BC be any different? I remember in previous calls um, where you mentioned that right from the hospital, um, because of our parents and uh, the document that they signed, that were basically deemed outpatients of a military establishment. Which yep, is what a hospital absolutely. Is. That's what a hospital is. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I've been thinking, mulling that over for many months since you first 
first brought that to my attention and just wondering if that needs to be the initial first step to correct that presumption, as misguided as it is. Well, if, if they were a well-oiled military precision machine, the answer is yes, but they're not. They're kind of loose alliances of um, organized crime. So <laughs> it, 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 it's not as complicated as that, yeah? The presumption is important to understand, but the simplicity is the courts operate virtually with impunity because you are declared intestate and they yeah. appoint themselves the executor and trustees. Yeah? Mm -hmm. so, so would you recommend doing anything with the BC? Or? No. I, I, look, we, we, we use the, the birth certificate as the transport mechanism of the ecclesiastical deed because we wanted to give notice that we are not um, a pauper. You know, our, our, our passport that lists the P, whether that P stands for pauper or peon, for peonage, or whatever the P stands for, we know that it, it, the P originally formed uh, an identify, identifier for people who were considered basically, uh, you know, slaves, animals. Um, but no, I don't believe that we need to to uh, go back and and uh, and give notice and rebuttal and make our life more difficult. We merely need to step up and say, here is the registered um, evidence of our recorded deed. It's executed. Here is the the deed proving that we are also recorded as the uh, executor. Here is my affidavit, and here is my rebuttal uh, to you, any of your documents. Um, prove to me that I'm the, an employee with a payroll, otherwise you've made a mistake, and, and start to gain control by just basically um, rebutting their presumptions. I believe that is the clear... At this point, that appears to be the simplest method of moving forward. If we find in a few weeks' time and a few months' time that the system will not honour its own rules then I, you know, I, I, I want to reserve the right to change what I'm saying to you now. But at this point, it appears that there is uh, clear evidence that we were not fully aware of that we want to move on, and that is to rebut the presumption that we are in test state. Yeah? Yeah. Well, um, I would like to get a quick opinion on a current court proceeding that I recently went through on a hypothetical situation. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And a court, a court proceeding that was brought against you, if a default judgment has been entered in the case by, due to non-response, but, however, the claim was dealt with privately and administratively with the, with the other party through a notary, all documented, and basically non-response, and so they were in default. Um, yep. Now, would a recording, a public notice, as you stated, of the um, default garnered in the private against the other party, would that basically stop the default judgment garnered by the other party in the public? Um, the, the, the problem, the, the, well, yes and no. I mean, the, here's, where it gets a, here's where it gets a bit gray. Because the, the courts operate as almost franchises, yeah? Um, and while they operate according to some general principles, because we're dealing with trust law, in a sense, how they deal with each case may differ based on the personalities. In principle, if, if one is able to, to notarize uh, private proceedings and the, the matter is resolved and there has been um, constructive notice and, and it is all complete, then you know, there are a lot of, of matters at a, at a civil level that can be uh, dealt with. But if you're dealing with um, a court proceedings and there's been some kind of summary judgment already made, then really you, you have to get into your time capsule as the general executor and bring the estate up for review, get the tracings and get the record created, uh, sorry, record uh, uh, straightened up in that capacity. So um, I, I think the problem I find with a lot of notarised uh, proceedings is that if you are dead and intestate, then really what is all this noise going to do from the position of a beneficiary to a court 
in terms of their action, it's going to be largely ignored, isn't it? By probate court, yeah? 